Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Pastor Larry is out again this week doing KBC, Kentucky Baptist Convention stuff. He's actually doing, uh, working at a church that's had a lot of conflict in between, so he's there as part of conflict resolution, not only today, but through most of this week. He will be back with us next week, and I believe that may be the last time this, the rest of this year that he will be gone. I'm no promises on that, but uh, it's always a privilege for me to get to share, to, to, to preach the Word of God from uh, this pulpit. I don't take it lightly, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, but we're, again, in Acts chapter 1. We'll read those verses in just a minute. But we've been going through, uh, in our life groups, the Love Your Church book. Some of you have been doing that. Many of you, uh, if you're not part of a life group, you don't know what I'm talking about. But we're going to dive a little bit deeper about the witnessing. This week's lesson and chapter was about witnessing. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. But it's been a good study. I've heard from several of you about how good this study has been uh, in your class and for you even as an individual. Uh, But uh, we're we're coming to an end. And we're going to talk today about witnessing. And so, uh, glory, glory, for those of you that have already been through this lesson, you get to get a review. But those that weren't in a life group and are not participating in that, I'm just going to give a little bit of review as to that chapter, if that's okay. And if it's not, well, sorry. We're just going to go through uh, that chapter after I get a little bit of water here. Um, as, we, as, we, as we went through that witnessing, we, we found also that, that uh, when we witness and evangelize, it's not your grandmother's evangelism, right? And they talked about how in the, uh, in the 70s, uh, it, it was the field of dreams approach. If you build it, they will come. But that's a terrible evangelism strategy because many churches are landlocked. You can't build enough buildings. In fact, you don't have enough money if that's your evangelism strategy to build it, and they will come. And they will come if you build it just a little bit. Uh, We saw that as our church was built in 1965. People came. In 1978, built the Christian Outreach Center because in the 70s, that was the end thing is to have a gymnasium where you could have basketball and other activities, volleyball, whatever, and people would come as a result of that. But after a while, the newness wears off, doesn't it? And then in 2000-ish, we built the children's area and the great room, and so people came. But that's not going to keep people in churches, amen? Uh, Because what typically happens, if the evangelism strategy is built, and they will come, those that come for that evangelism strategy will go to the next church when they build something new. So that's not a good evangelism strategy, although it does get people here, and when they're here, we must do uh, the work of evangelism. It's also uh, one of the, the things of of evangelism over the years with evangelism explosion and faith evangelism was to go door to door and knock on doors. How many of you have done that before? You've uh, maybe it wasn't necessarily through one of those approaches, but you've gone door to door. Well, that's not a, it's not a dead strategy. So I'm not, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. However, in the culture we live in, you don't know if you knock on a door, you're going to be met with a hello or a 357. You're not really sure what is going to greet you at the door. And so we must be cautious and we must be, uh, and I'm saying that there are still people today that that's their evangelism strategy and praise the Lord for that because we need to get the name of Jesus out as best we can, as many ways as we can. That, that drew a few amens. It should draw more, but it is really the reality. We should do whatever we can. That's why it's great. We're grateful we're on, on WPSD. We're also on the uh, internet. And so we're grateful. We just get the word out in any way that we can. Uh, programs aren't a good evangelism strategy because after a while, you have to create a new program to draw more people. In fact, here's the reality of programs in, the, in Southern Baptist life. When you start something, you can't kill it. That's kind of everybody's approach. You can't kill that because, I mean, I love that. You know, when its useful life is about three years, 30 years later, we're still doing the same thing. And you know what I'm talking about if you've been in Baptist life very long. It's just a reality. It's not a good evangelism strategy. And so we must go away from that. Uh, Another thing that's so important about about evangelism is the heart is the heart of the matter, really. It's what kind of heart do we have for the lost, uh, the, the text that we looked at is to, we're to set apart Christ as holy in our hearts. And so uh, when it comes to evangelism, it's all about the heart. What is our purpose? What is our goal? What is our motivation? And in fact, how is our heart? How is our heart in all of this? Are we setting apart Christ as holy in our hearts? And so that's very important to look at that. But another thing that really is, uh, it's not new, but maybe there's a new focus on it, is that goodness gets people asking questions. In fact, the more we can serve, the more that we as the body of Christ can serve and love on other people, the more questions they will ask, why are you doing this? 
Maybe you've experienced that before. As you serve somebody that didn't ask for it, somebody you may not know that well as you serve them, they say, why are you being nice to me? And so goodness does prompt questions as we serve because we're believers. In fact, James says, and James, uh, in the book of James, he says, faith without work, it works is dead. It is a dead faith. It's not an active faith. It's not a living faith. In fact, I would wonder if you don't have works, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, James is not saying we work for salvation. He's saying we work because of salvation. We have good deeds. We have good works because of what Christ has done for us. So that is part of what happens. And so people will ask questions. uh, But one of the biggest reasons that we don't witness is fear. If I were to do a, a, a survey here that was a secret survey, nobody would see what you wrote down, and I had a list of five or six reasons uh, what's your biggest challenge to, to witnessing, and the, I promise you that the overwhelming answer would be fear. Some of you wouldn't fear, fill the survey out out of fear, <laughs> but I mean, you would. Uh, fear would be the biggest reason that we don't share, and so we must redirect our fear from our fear to Christ. Right? I mean, he is the point of all of this anyway. And if we set Christ apart in our hearts as holy, and then we redirect our fear to him and realize he's the one that does all the work anyway, then what's the risk? We're, but I know we're afraid of relationships that might be different, that might be changed or lost. We're afraid we don't have enough to say. And you know the story because you thought about what your fear is as we've talked about this. And so we uh, have fear, but the truth of the matter is, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be minute men of the gospel, minute men and women, minute men and women of the gospel. We need to be ready to share at a moment's notice. We just need to be ready to share. What do we share? The hope that's within us. Anybody in here, by the way, got any hope at all? In a world that's hopeless, anybody got hope? Raise your hand. If you're not, we'll come and talk to you after the service. But I mean, the reality is we have hope because of Christ. And so we should be ready at a moment's notice to share Christ with anybody that we might come in contact with or for anybody that would ask. So that is how it works. And then certainly as we talk about this and talk about all these strategies that aren't strategies, build it, they will come. There's no target market for that. If we knock on doors, we have a target market of a little area, but it's not consistent, it's not lasting, but he talks really, which is really a great strategy. If you think about this, you can call it network. In fact, people get away from network evangelism because they think of network marketing and pyramid schemes. It's not about that. It's about working in your network. We have, let me rephrase it, we have spheres of influence in every one of us has a sphere of influence that we can tap into. The very first thing is our family. If you're here and you have young, young kids, or if you're a grandparent and you've got young grandkids, man, what, a, what a, a fertile field to sow the seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Talk about it, as, as the Shema says in Deuteronomy 6, that you should do it when you lie down and when you wake and when you walk along the way, just sharing Jesus, not only in word, but in action. Being a Christian, modeling what a Christian should look like, and then also to your grandkids, doing the same thing. And we look forward to uh, being able to, we're, we're doing it now, I guess, but doing that to our little Esther that's here and our other grandkids as they grow up and are in our uh, home and in our sphere of influence to being Jesus to them. So our, our networks of influence, our geographical influence, right? We all live in different places. Some of our circles overlap. Well, what about a multiple, uh, multiple prong attack if some of you live in the same neighborhood that we just be Jesus to somebody? Also, we work in different places. We go to convenience stores. Uh, Just be Jesus, be nice, be kind, be loving, be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. One of the things that I like, I want to talk about just for a second. Uh, Certainly, we're to pray. We'll talk deeper about that in a minute. But one of the things he says is just to invite. And let me just take the pressure off a little bit for evangelism and for witnessing. If you would just invite people that you know, in fact, just pick one. Let's, make it, let's lower this bar down almost to where you just have to step over it. Just invite one person you know to church. Not just one time. Continue to invite them. Because, you know, the title of the book is Love Your Church. The question, I guess, is do you love your church? Hopefully not more than your Lord, but do you love your church? And if you love your church, then you're going to invite people to come. It's like we were talking in the uh, Joy Fellowship class. How many of you have found a new restaurant that you just love and you can't wait to tell people about? 
How many of you have watched a movie lately that you have recommended to people because you liked it so much you couldn't wait to tell them, you wanted them to see it? Do you love your church? Invite people to come. Because if they come to First Baptist, they're going to sit under the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they'll hear the gospel, so invite people. I would even challenge you. You won't do it, but I'm going to promise. I'm going to challenge you this. Some of you said, I'll do it now. See, that's kind of the motivation. I'll, t- I'll tell you, you can't do it, and you will do it. Invite somebody. This week, invite somebody. Consistently invite somebody. Make it so they can't say no. Say, I'll meet you. I'll pick you up. I'll this, I'll whatever. And this place will look different next week. Just invite somebody to come. They'll sit under the teaching of the Word of God. And so that's my preaching, I guess. And we're not finished, by the way, but that's just some of the preaching. Is that we must invite people to come and hear the Word of Jesus Christ. And really, some of the key to having guests and evangelism, certainly God is the power. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the key to all this is you and me. It's just being available. Being available and ready to share for the hope that you have. And being able to to, uh, witness to people with just the way you live and the words that you say. That is some of the key. And so that's a little bit of a rewind into that chapter. And some of you are saying, God, I wish my teacher had been that short. Uh, But uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. That was a joke, but it wasn't a good attempt. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. This won't be on the screen, by the way, so you'll have to use your device or your hard copy of the Word of God. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and then we'll dive into this just a little bit. We'll go into Acts chapter 4 later, and actually John chapter 9 too. But look at this. Read with me. This is Dr. Luke writing. He says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. Uh, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and many and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And we'll stop there. Pray with me, please. Father, as we go a little deeper into witnessing, Father, help open our eyes to what you have to say in your word, but also Uh, to what you have to speak to our hearts today. May your word come alive to all of us, and may we see just uh, what a task you've given us as followers of Jesus, Lord. And if we don't do it, who will? Just help us to have that attitude, God, and show us what you would have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are a few things as we talk about witnessing, and some of you may be comfortable or uncomfortable with witnessing, but my first point is this. Like it or not, you are a witness. Like it or not, you're a witness. You don't have to be comfortable with it. You don't have to really enjoy it. But like it or not, you are a witness. I am a witness. If you look at verse 8, he says there, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, he says, you will be my witnesses. And isn't it amazing that God can do it any way he wants, but yet he chooses to use people to be his witnesses? Isn't that amazing? What an opportunity we have as followers of Jesus to be involved in the work of God. He chooses us. He wants us to do this. We will be his witnesses. And see, by the way, you'll be a witness whether it's a verbal witness or not in the way that you live, in the way that you act, in the way that you treat people, the way that we treat people. That is a witness. Amen? I mean, it is. But that's not the only witness. We still must use words. 
We still must use words to preach the gospel or teach the gospel or tell the gospel to people. God chooses us to do it, and he wants us to be witnesses. And by the way, you are a witness. We must look at that. And a witness is a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. Court cases are won or lost because of the power of a witness, somebody that has an eyewitness testimony that's taken place. And who better to share about what God has done in their life than you and me? share about the power of the gospel at work in our lives. We are witnesses, like it or not. That's the truth. But here's the other part that kind of takes the pressure off. You can do this. Point two, you can do this. A lot of you are saying right now, I don't really think I can. I'm not really sure that I want to, but you can do this. And that's the the other part of verse eight. He says, Jesus says to them, you'll receive what church? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And by the way, the same power that lives in the, uh, the disciples lives in you and me. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith and trust in him, then you have power. He man is not the only one that has the power. Some of you get that reference. But the reality is we as Christians have the power to share. I don't know what that power does other than give us a boldness, Right? It gives us the words, we have the power, we have, I guess to break it down a little bit more, we have the ability to share with others about Jesus. That's the truth of what it is. We receive the same power when we trust in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, I want you to flip there, it's just a few pages over, Acts chapter 4, actually we'll be in 4, but I'm going to go back to chapter 3. In chapter 3, Peter and John are getting ready to go to the temple and they pass by Solomon's gate. And they see this man that's been lame from birth. You remember the story? And all he's doing is begging for money. He's begging for a way to support his family and to help him to sustain him along the way. And Peter and John walk up to him and Peter says, hey, I'm going to tell you, buddy, this is a paraphrase, by the way. You won't find it in very many translations, probably none. But he said, hey, listen, silver and gold, I don't have any money. I don't have anything to give you, but what I give, have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. What happened? His ankles were strengthened. He's been lame for his entire life, and all of a sudden, he has strength in his body, and he gets up and walks, and people are just amazed. And they go to the temple, and this, this guy goes to the temple, and people are hearing all about this stuff, and this is where we get to chapter 4. The religious leaders don't like it. Shocker, right? They don't like what they hear. And so they bring Peter and and John into their midst, and they say, uh, you need to quit talking about this stuff. You need to stop it. And then we get to chapter 4 and verse 7. Look at verse 7. They bring them into their midst. And and when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, look at this, filled with the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit bring, church? Power. Power. The Holy Spirit brings power. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, he's getting ready to share the gospel. Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. In other words, nobody's taking the credit. I'm the one that said by the power of Jesus Christ, rise and walk, but it's God that did it, right? He's not taking the credit. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Wow. He starts to talk, and what happens? The Holy Spirit fills him, and he gets the power. He's got the power, and he shares with Jesus Christ to people that don't want to hear. Have you ever done that before, by the way? Have you ever been out sharing about Jesus, and then you come across people that don't want to hear? I mean, it's very common. But you have power. He shares in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives him the boldness to share and lifts him up as he shares uh, boldly in the face of the religious leaders, uh, that thing. But a lot of people would say, you know what, I'm nothing special. I mean, that was Peter and John. That was Peter and John. They, I mean, they've been with Jesus. They're more qualified than I am. And I would say to that, here's a good theological answer, baloney. Okay? Because look at the next verse. Look at verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, do I have any of those in the house today? They were astonished 
and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Wow. So you see, that takes the pressure off. I don't have to be a pastor. I don't have to be a PhD, have a PhD. I don't have to be a theologian. I just have to know the gospel and be able to tell how the gospel has changed my life. When Peter got ready to talk, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he just talked. He told the power of God and how God was the one that changed this man, that this, this God that you crucified, who God raised from the dead. He just told what he knew and he shared that God will empower us to be a witness if we'll just step out of our comfort zone. You see, as you talk about that, it's really important to understand, and we saw it in our lesson, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. As it comes to evangelism, you can do this, but I want to tell you this, don't forget to pray because prayer is vital. When it comes to witnessing, prayer is vital that we do this. Prayer and the Holy Spirit will allow us to speak boldly and not obnoxiously. I think our lesson today said that. Don't be, don't be rude and don't be one of those people. But share what you know. Because you see, here's, we're going to be back in chapter 1 real quickly. Then we'll come back to 4. So this is kind of your Bible drill for the day. But it's only a few pages so you won't get lost. You see, if we were to go back to chapter 1 and what Jesus told the disciples, he gave them this mandate to be witnesses. What he told them about where they were going, he said, now here's the deal, guys. I want you to go to Jerusalem where they hate you. Right? You remember that? That's where they were when Jesus was crucified and they scattered. They're, gonna, they're coming after you too. I want you to go to Jerusalem where they hate you. Oh, and by the way, you're going to go to uh, Judea and Samaria where you hate them. Okay, get this. You're going to go where they hate you and where you hate them. And then you're going to go to places that you don't even know exist yet and aren't even sure how to get there. Wow. Wow. If we were to look at the, we read it today, but if we were to look at that, I'm sure some of them, just, this is kind of how my mind works. I'm sure as they got there, they're, they're, Jesus says all this, and then he goes, they just sit there watching him doing this. I'm sure their mouth was like this because the angel said, why are you standing there gazing up into heaven? Jesus is going to come back the same way that he came, that he left. And I'm sure one of them looked to the other and said, hey, did you write down what he said? Because I didn't catch all that. The angel said, you need to go. So they went back to Jerusalem. What did they do when they got to Jerusalem? They prayed. I can imagine that they got on their faces before the Lord and said, God, you've given us a big task. And if you don't do this, we're sunk. There is no way that we can be witnesses in all of these places that you're having us go. There is not a chance that this is going to happen. For whatever reason, God in his sovereignty has chosen to limit the activity of his, of his people to the prayers of his people. Andrew Murray wrote this. He said, God rules the world and his church through the prayers of his people. God calls for intercessors. In his grace, he has made his work dependent on them. But I will tell you this. If you want to empty out a building, call a prayer meeting. It will just happen. We have a group that meets here on uh, Sunday nights faithfully for over a year. We have uh, ladies that meet on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, right, Lynn? Tuesdays and Wednesdays to pray, and there's just a small group of people. Not that small groups aren't good, but we certainly in this process, Scott, as we pray, we must be unified in prayer. And I know, too, it's not that we all come together to pray. We can't pray anywhere else because we can go. I mean, Jesus went into a private place by himself to pray, and so we do that. But corporate prayer is so vital and so important. If you were to look back at, you know, we don't have to go there either, but if you were to look at chapter 4, where Peter and John have been released to go, they go back to all the people, verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported that the chief, what the chief priests and elders had done, and then when they heard it, they lifted their voices together in prayer. It doesn't say that. It gives a list of all their prayers. They praise the Lord for all that, and then in verse, uh, verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was what? 
shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Because you see, prayer does change things. Prayer changes me, it changes you. It gets me in tune with what God would have me to do. But prayer also gives me a boldness because of the power of the Holy Spirit in me. See, they prayed and the place was shaken. They were all filled with boldness to continue to preach and teach the word of God. Prayer is vital in the life of believers when it comes to witnessing and sharing the gospel. It's very, very, very important. And it's not just important for that. It's important for all of life, by the way. Amen? Amen. I mean, we must be people of prayer for our personal lives, for the life of our bo- this body, and for all things we must pray, but especially as it comes to evangelism. It gives us wisdom, it gives us strength, and it gives us guidance for the mission. As we continue to look at this witnessing aspect of our lives as believers, you are a witness, and uh, you just tell what you know next. It says prayer is vital, but the next thing is just tell what you know. Tell what you know. Now, I'm going to, you don't have to go to John chapter 9, but I'm going to tell you the story that is going on in John chapter 9. Jesus comes upon a man that's been blind from birth. You'll remember the story as we talk about it. And Jesus grabbed some dirt on the ground and spit into it and made mud, and he put it on the man's eyes and said, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he goes and washes himself in the pool of Siloam, and all of a sudden, go figure, he can see now. And people are just amazed. And one of the crazy things is the religious leaders get involved again. Somehow, they're always there. The religious leaders get involved and they realize he's done this on the Sabbath. He's a sinner. You can't do this on the Sabbath. I mean, we've got all these rules, all these laws about what you can do. And then he says, uh, but he did it on there. And they said, you know, they said to this man that was born blind, what do you say that he is? He says, a prophet. Well, they didn't like that answer, so they called his parents in. His parents come in, let's, tell, let's get mama and daddy and see what they have to say about this. In fact, they're questioning whether this man was truly blind from birth or not. So they call his mom and daddy and they say, yeah, that's our son. He's blind from birth, da 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 And they keep asking questions. And, and because they don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue, good Jews, they don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. They say, hey, hold on just a second. He's old enough to speak for himself. And so they call him back in. They say, what do you say about this man? Tell us all about him. Is he a sinner? And then he says this in um, John chapter 9 and verse 25. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He didn't have an explanation for everything that went on. Sure, he could tell what Jesus did. He knew about the, he'd heard about the dirt. He didn't see it because he's not able to see yet. But he heard about the dirt. He told, hey, this is what he told me to do. But he had no explanation for what God had done in his life other than I was blind, but now I see. He hadn't gone to seminary. He hadn't studied all of Grudem's book of theology to know all about Jesus. He just knew what happened to him. And the reality of being a witness is you tell what you know. And the dirty word for that in the church is your testimony. Because people are, oh, I'm just scared to death to tell my testimony. Why are you afraid? Why am I afraid to tell what Jesus did for me? Nobody can dispute your testimony because it's yours. It's mine. So we just share what we know. I once was this before Christ. This is how I was. Then I had this life-changing experience where I recognized I was a sinner and God radically saved me. And now my life after Jesus is this. Wow, that is a testimony. Just sharing what God has done in your life. You just share what you know. You need to be able to articulate the gospel, right? But you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to know all of these different things about this or that. or what. Just share the gospel and share what you know. And lastly, silence is not an option. Silence is not an option. We've been called to go. The Great Commission tells us to go. In Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples. Paul, or Mark's translation of that says, go and preach the gospel and make disciples. So uh, sharing the gospel is a part of going. We must do that. Silence is not an option. So we go back finally to our last part of this message in chapter 4 as Peter and John are about to be released 
They don't want to harm them because they're afraid of the uproar. They can't dispute what's happened. So they just give them a harsh talking to. Have you ever done that to your kids? Now, don't you do that again, right? They said, shame, shame, James and or, uh, Peter and John, don't, don't do that anymore. Probably a little harsher than that. But they said, we don't want you to speak in that name anymore. And then Peter and John say this in verse 19 of chapter 4. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak about what we have seen and what we've heard. You see, when Jesus comes in, he saves you. And then throughout your life, he sustains you. He provides for you in ways you never thought possible. When he gives you peace in the storm. When you see in the valley of the shadow of death, the Savior is with you. When you have challenges in your relationships, maybe your marriage or maybe with your children. God does a work. You just can't keep quiet about it. I mean, you're so excited that you just can't hide it. Amen. You're about to lose control and you just can't fight it. <laughs> right? Because you can't stay silent. Amen. Whether it's right to believe you or God, you decide. But we cannot help but speak about the things that we've seen and we've heard. So as followers of Jesus, silence is not an option. In Acts chapter 2, we see the beginning of the witnessing. The Holy Spirit's come. We see that Peter gets the task of preaching to people that don't speak his language. But somehow, through the power of the Spirit, everybody understands in their own language the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preaches. Word tells us that they were cut to the heart. In other words, they were convicted and they said, what must we do to be saved? And 3,000 were saved. We see the scripture tell us that. They gathered together in homes. They Loved on one another. They listened to the apostles' teaching. They broke bed. They fellowshiped. They did all these things. They supplied the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ as they had need. As a result of all that, the Lord added to their number daily. Verse 47 of chapter 2. Okay, you see, when the Spirit of God came in and did a work, a movement started that continues today. A movement of the gospel of Jesus Christ from this little ragtag bunch of men and women to where we are today. Unfortunately, all around us, even in our own city, are churches that are closing their doors. I heard this week of another church that's about to close their doors because they don't have any more people. That's what happens when churches don't share the gospel. They want us for and no more. And they're not worried about outside. They're worried only about inside. And after a while, they literally die because the people do, because they have no new life in them. And so they become a monument. In fact, if you've been to Europe lately, uh, I think Julie's been to Europe, and the, the, the landscape is littered with beautiful cathedrals that are just museums anymore, but they're not places of worship. If you don't have to go to Europe, though, you just go around our area, you'll find doors that have been closed because they were not intentional about reaching out. So they become monuments. I guess there's a question that I have for us as First Baptist Paducah, really a question for any church that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you want to be part of a movement, or do you want this to be a monument? That's the question that every church must answer. Not about drama. It's just a reality. Do we want to be part of a movement, or do we want this place to be a monument? So what do we do? We be witnesses. We tell of what God has done in our life, 
not threatening, not demanding, not uh, uh, being dogmatic or in people's face. We just tell what Jesus has done and the hope that we have because of him. And I want to tell you what, if we do that, and it starts, some of that starts with inviting. If we do that, just buckle in and hold on. I mean, if we set the sails through prayer and, and petitioning the Lord and we are obedient to the Lord, when we, if we set the sails, when the wind of the Spirit blows, we'll be ready and God will continue to push us on down the road. Father, today, we bow before you. And God, as we have gone a little bit deeper into the witnessing aspect of what you have for us and you expect from us as your followers. God, we ask you to uh, convict us. You've already empowered us, but help us to realize the power that we do have because of the Spirit. And God, I just pray that you'll do amazing things. God, you compel us all to invite, to be available, just to do good to those that are around us, and be ready to give an answer for the gospel and the hope that we have. God, today I pray that you'll do whatever you need to do in the hearts of your people. And if there's anybody here that's not trusted Christ, God, I pray you'll move in such a way that they have no other choice but to make him Lord. And we give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.